Good afternoon and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. We are brought to you through a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. And it's my weekly pleasure to introduce the founder of our organization, Dr. Richard Deming, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Deming. Great, thanks Chris and welcome everybody. So I'm looking forward to tonight's conversation. Uh, as our guest tonight, we have Maria Steele and her husband, Pat. So Pat and Maria Steele. And um, Maria and I probably knew each other a bit and shared some patients. Uh, Maria is a nurse practitioner and she'll tell you a bit more about her, um, her profession but we really got to know each other on January 8th of 2020. So over a year ago when we first met as patient and doctor and uh, Maria has been on her cancer journey since uh, before then, I think it was uh, the diagnosis was made probably in December. Yeah. And um, I just wanna have uh, uh, Maria and Pat tell their story, but then we're gonna have a conversation about uh, living with cancer and uh, what's that like from both the patient perspective, who also happens to be a medical care provider as a nurse practitioner, and what it's like from her husband's perspective and how it may or may not have changed their philosophy about life. So I'm gonna turn it over to Maria and Pat. Okay, thank you, Dr. Deming and Chris. And I'd like to Thank the Iowa Cancer Consortium for having this. Uh, I think it's really important that people hear from cancer survivors themselves because uh, sometimes you think you're all alone and you're really not. And I've, I'm finding that out uh, as I go on this journey. And I do like calling it a journey because some people talk about warriors and fighting and uh, I kind of respectfully disagree with that. I think this is a journey and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it, so thank you. So my cancer journey started a week before Christmas in 2019. I had had um, a cough when I laid down at night and a little bit decreased stamina. Um, I have some family members who have cardiovascular disease to include heart disease and stroke. So I did the thing I knew I should. I went and had a treadmill done, um, passed with flying colors, had the carotid. I mean, as a nurse practitioner, you know what you should do. And I worked in the ER for almost 18 years prior to my nurse practitioner life. So I knew what I needed to rule out. And when the cardiovascular exam was okay, I thought, well, gosh, I'm in a gastroenterology office. Maybe it's heartburn. So a little cough you know, at night, maybe it was reflux. So I took, took some medicine, it didn't work. Finally, Pat said, Maria, you really need to go see your nurse practitioner. This, this has been going on too long. So I went and saw um, Dixie, my nurse practitioner. Um, she did a chest x-ray on a Monday. It looked worrisome. I had a CAT scan on Wednesday. Uh, she called me that night and said, it looks like it could be cancer. She actually sent me the report. I mean, it was unbelievable that potentially there was a primary lung tumor for someone who had never smoked, you know? So that took me back quite a ways. And I contacted one of my colleagues, uh, Karen, and she said, we need to contact one of our docs. Let's get this ball rolling. And they did. And that Friday, I had a bronchoscopy with a tissue diagnosis and was told I had stage three. But then in my follow-up, they said, well, you need a brain scan and you need a PET scan. And so then I had those and what really floored me and was probably one of the hardest things was when I was told I had metastasis to my brain. And um, I, I, I just, it was unbelievable. I mean, I've been healthy my whole life, uh, no prescription meds, never smoked, exercised regularly. And here I have a state, now I have a stage four um, so diagnosis, because if you have metastasis to your brain, you automatically go into the stage four group. So that was pretty crazy. And so I went and saw Dr. Behrens, who was kind of explaining what needed to be done. 
And he said, well, you're going to need radiation to your brain. Um, who do you want to see for your radiologist? And I said, well, the only one I really know is Dr. Deming. <laughs> and he literally walked out of the room, came back a few minutes later and had you on speakerphone who was apologizing that we had to meet this way. <laughs> So, and, and by the way, could I come over that afternoon? And we're like, yeah. yes. <laughs> so um, I had already canceled my patients for the day and, you know, we went and met you and you were very, took a lot of time, which I appreciate because, you know, as a patient, you're just incredulous that this is happening. You have so many questions. And then as a healthcare professional, you know, you know, stage four is not good. And, um, you know, and then Dr. Behrens, he, you know, I asked him because I really didn't know, how long do you think I have? And he said, you know, Maria, statistically, you have a year. And I thought, no, no way, no way. And he said, but you know what that means? That means 50% will live more, 50% will live less. And, you know, you're in very good health and I think you will do well. Um, so that was kind of the start of my journey and then COVID hit. So, yeah. Hey, Maria, before, um, before you go further, I want to focus on one thing that's kind of a, obviously a seminal event and that's being told you have cancer. So yes. go back in time a little bit and maybe just describe what you remember feeling emotionally, physically, when you were told you have cancer. And then I want to ask Pat the same thing, Pat, when did you find out and did you find out from, from Maria or a, what, what was your first thought? And then um, obviously the thought when it was, oh my gosh, stage four, lung cancer. Yeah, I mean, cancer is the big C, <laughs> you know? And other than my dad having prostate cancer in his late 80s, and of course I had had some skin cancer from too much sun, but I mean, no one in our family had cancer. I mean, I have 60 some first cousins. My dad is the oldest of 11. My mom is the oldest of seven. You know, I mean, I have all these cousins and I really had not heard of anybody having anything like this. So a lot of it was, I, I can't believe, I mean, I do believe it. I mean, I get it. Um, but there was a big part of me that was just like, I can't believe it. You know, I'm on no meds. I have no other problems. How could this be cancer? Especially not smoking, you know, and then that led into my research about radon. And that's kind of another story, but, and maybe we'll get into that later, but yeah, no, it was, it was just, especially being told, um, I had brain mats. I mean, we went to our church that night and I literally fell on my knees and ask God for help. As far as me, Dr. Deming, um, you know, I, um, I think when Maria had the bronchoscopy on a Friday, uh, we we're waiting for the procedure to, to start. One of her doctor colleagues stopped in and said, you know, what, what are you doing here? And, <laughs> and then when Maria kind of told her story, I, I could just see by her body language and the expression on her face that uh, we probably were not going to get good news. And so uh, after the bronchoscopy, the uh, doctor came and talked to us. Maria was still a little bit fuzzy from the anesthesia. So she uh, you know, was a little bit confused, but our two children, Zach and Val, were there. And I was there as he gave us the news. And um, you know, I guess I had had a little time to kind of prepare myself thinking, okay, we're, the diagnosis is going to be cancer. And now I think it's just a matter of what stage probably. So I was a little bit prepared. Our, our two children weren't as much. And like I said, Maria was still a little uh, fuzzy, I yeah. think about, you know, kind of with the procedure she had had. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think we've both tried to do in our lives is, uh, you know, you can't always control what will happen to you, but you have a responsibility to try to control how you respond to it. And so I think we, uh, I think, tried to gather as much information as we could and kind of what 
what was going to happen, what this was going to look like. And, um, you know, we were not matter of fact about it. It was, it's emotional, but on the other side, there's part of you just have to kind of keep things together and what are we going to do? And we, you know, we knew we had to share the news with people and, um, that was tough and, um, you know, kind of spreading that particularly right around Christmas, we were been scheduled to have a family Christmas out in Colorado. Yeah. I, I was going to ask about that. So the, the bronchoscopy was on December 20th and then the, the, the PET scan and MRI weren't till the first week of January. How, how was Christmas? <laughs> well, so we were supposed to go to Colorado with Pat's family and they weren't excited. We we're going to drive, but they weren't, you know, I had talked to Dr. Johnson prior to the procedure and I told him I really wanted to know what stage it was. And I do remember him saying stage three, but I don't remember thinking, are you kidding me? Because I had seen the CAT scan report. I, I didn't think it was going to be good. I mean, I know I had enlarged lymph nodes. I knew, you know, I had bone mets. I mean, I knew all that. I didn't know about the brain at this point, but so I knew it wasn't good. Um, and I remember him be, being very kind and right next to my face and said, you know, Maria, it's stage three. And I, I don't remember reacting after that, but I remember sort of the reaction of the family. But as far as a week before Christmas, so now, you know, I would asked if it was okay to go to, to the Denver area. And they said, well, altitude, just having a bronchoscopy, probably not a good idea. So, and we had this van rented because we were all going to, our daughter and her husband, our son and his wife, uh, we're all going to go out together. So I said, I don't want to stay around home. Let's go to the Mococata Caves. Let's, I've never been there. Let's go hiking. You know, um, I didn't want to just sit around and mope because that's kind of not me. It's not us. And I thought we're going to do something special. It's not going to be Colorado, darn it, but let's go. But yeah, there are those times when we're sitting around opening gifts. It's like, it kind of goes through your head. Is this my last Christmas? You know, um, deep down inside, I didn't think it was going to be. I mean, I just, I just felt like I needed to wait and see how treatments were going to go, how they were going to go, what I needed, what I didn't need, you know, and I hadn't met with Dr. Barron's yet or you. So I really didn't know at that point. Oh. Yeah, in terms of me for Christmas, I, you know, kind of like Maria, I, I remember looking at hers, we're opening gifts and thinking, I wasn't thinking she wasn't going to be here a year from now. I just thought, boy, what her, her body could be ravaged over the next year with treatments and et cetera, because you think of chemotherapy and you, you've seen friends who've gone through that and you realize, I mean, that's going to have quite an impact. So that was my thought, not just, you know, that she's not going to be here a year from now, but uh, just what this next upcoming year is going to uh, to be like. But I think Maria really kind of set the tone for our family and all of our friends is because, you know, a lot of people with the stage three diagnosis, last thing they want to do is take off hiking in wintertime. And uh, <laughs> so, but I think that was, I think that was really important. Uh, I, one of the milestones is, okay, this is the approach we're going to take. We're going to try to live our lives as we continue to live them to the extent we can. And, uh, and off we went and had a great had hiking. A great and time. Couldn't go to Makoka to caves because uh, I think the bats uh, had some kind of a disease or something. They so the closed. caves were closed. So we went to Backbone State Park near uh, Strawberry Point, Lamont area, Northeast Iowa. Mines of Spain. Good, I had never heard went, of Mines of Spain. <laughs> and then we went to Dubuque after that. And uh, and then on the way back, stopped at the Amana Colonies for shopping, which was not my favorite thing to do. But, you know. <laughs> I guess somebody with stage three cancer gets to make some choices. So, <laughs> so she got to make that one. But um, so, yeah, I think that really kind of set the tone as how we're going to approach this and try to live our lives like we had and do the things we wanted to do. I remember Dr. Barron's telling us, uh, you know, if you've got a bucket list, if you've got some things to do, go start doing them. And if you get them yeah. all done, then start over. And, uh, yeah. and so we got good advice from him uh, as well on that. And I think yeah. that's and the approach we took. So to kind of uh, sort of sum up the medical part. So then in January, you had the PET scan confirmed mm -hmm. that there was metastatic disease in the bone. And then you had the MRI that showed six brain metastases. Right. So right. what, you know, optimistically went from stage three plummeted to stage four. Yeah. And the conversation about your cancer is treatable 
but not curable. Right. Then, and then as you pointed out, you're a non-smoker and then the genetic testing of your cancer cells came back. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll let you tell the story of the genetic testing of your cancer cells, what that showed and how that changed the path. Right. So, um, so they, they could do biomarker testing now. And apparently the tissue diagnosis um, wasn't sufficient enough to do the biomarker. So then I had to do a blood test and that was agonizing waiting for that to come back. I think it took 10 days. So um, that told me I was um, EGFR as a, I'll call it a subtype. Um, and so what that meant was I did not need the severe, I'll call it severe um, IV chemo that would do the ravaging effects as Pat had mentioned. Um, and in fact would be a pill to take every day um, with side effects potentially. Um, and I, I did have side effects, but then again, I also needed radiation. So I needed the cyber knife treatments. So I had to get fitted for that face mask where you're bolted down to the table. And so I could hold still. And that was pretty freaky. I mean, that was, um, that for someone who's, who's claustrophobic, that was tough. That was tough. But um, then I find out that the head of CyberKnife is my high school classmate uh, from Dowling, Nancy Finney, who's now Nancy Bellevue? Belleville. Belleville. So Nancy, you know, is giving me her cell number and is telling me, you know, we'll take care of you. I see her there. I mean, it was like a high school reunion, you know? So, um, yeah, and it was good that I had her cell phone because my very first cyber knife treatment, it was a snowstorm. So we left 45 minutes early thinking, okay, and we're on Interstate 80 coming from Adele and traffic is slowed down. So I, I call Nancy's and she goes, Marie, it's a flip phone. You can't text me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I know, you know, she has a flip phone, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm calling her and she's like, Maria, it's okay. I mean, I'm nervous enough as it is. Um, <laughs> but she's like, it's okay, Maria. We'll take you when you get here. I'm thinking I'm late for my first brain <laughs> radiation treatment. Are you kidding me? My, my anxiety would be through the roof uh, if it wasn't a stable roof. So Pat was very calm as always. And uh, we got there and it all, it all worked out, so. Yeah. And um, so let, let's shift gears and, and uh, go from medical to a little bit more philosophical. So um, you, it has now been, you know, a year and four months, maybe since you were first diagnosed, you look fabulous. Um, uh, the audience should know that uh, Maria, Pat, and I have set a date to go on a 72-mile bike ride in a couple of weeks, <laughs> and um, uh, they've been uh, living their life uh, as they always have, you know, looking for joy and spreading joy. So I know that um, uh, the cancer diagnosis didn't turn you into this healthy athletic person who loves to spread joy, that that's part of your essence. Maybe talk a little bit about what cancer has done. In, in what way do you think it has changed either your philosophical outlook or your approach or how you think about today or how you think about tomorrow? Big question. It is a big question, but it's a good question. Um, I feel like, you know, if it hasn't, if, if I didn't have faith, I would be a mess. I mean, I think um, my faith, and I think I can say this, honestly, our faith um, has gotten us through a lot. Um, so I, I think it's strengthened it even more. And it, I feel like it's made me feel like it's okay to talk to people about it, you know? Um, so that, and I also, I would say gratitude you know, gratitude is the attitude, <laughs> you know, it, it's not, it, you, you still have to think of others though, too. So that's another thing um, to try and think of others. And I think my overall philosophy is to try and, you know, trust in God and help others. 
I think that's why I went into nursing in the first place, you know, in the, in the 70s. Um, you know, I wanted to help people. My mom was a nurse. I saw how people respected her in our little town of Granger growing up. And I thought, that's what I would do. I want to help people. And so I ended up, um, you know, retiring probably a year earlier than I was going to. Um, but I, and then of course, then COVID happens. So, you know, I, I think I still try and look for ways to help others because then you don't feel so focused on yourself because yeah. that's not always the best thing. I mean, I, I take care of myself, but I mean, as far as it's not all about me, if I can help others, that's a good thing. So Maria, what I'm hearing you say is that essentially you, you didn't change. You just became more aware of what was important to you and that, absolutely and, yes. and, and taking care of yourself and also helping other people was always part of what you did. You just now became more aware that that was something that provided you great joy. Yes. Yes. And, and I think the other thing of you don't sweat the little stuff anymore, mm. you know, is it really that important? I mean, <laughs> I think if anything, I, I, I always have, I, I've always liked to be right. <laughs> you, know? you know, I don't always have to be right. You know, there's other ways than my way of doing things, you know? And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, you learn not to sweat the small stuff and yeah. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, bad things happen to people all the time, good people, and, you know, why, we don't know. But, you know, we had faced, you know, a tragedy earlier in our marriage when our oldest son was killed in a car accident. And I remember my oldest sister, Linda, calling me a couple of days after the funeral and said, you've got to find something positive out of this. And I'm thinking, how do you find positive? We just buried an 18 year old uh, son. And, um, but that really struck me because so after that, I said, okay, we are gonna do something. So we formed a foundation, we've given you know money to bear our interest and interest at uh, Reflective Bart. Um, and so out of this, then I think, okay, we've got this now, what good can we can come out of this? And Maria's really taking the lead on that with you know trying to educate, uh, be very open about her own journey and then, you know, what may have been the causes and some things that she could do. So I, I think, you know, you always have to try to find something good and then uh, use that to, to provide maybe some focus. And I think also to, you know, to model for others, you know, what, what you can do when, when tragedy hits or bad news hits, you know, how, how do you respond to that? Like I said earlier, uh, you know, you, you can't control what happens to you, but you can't control how you respond to it. And I think that's how we've tried to, to do this the last uh, 16 months. And, you know, frankly, when we, I went to the appointments with Maria and I, you sit in the waiting room and you realize, my God, you're not the only one on this journey. There are right. thousands of people uh, on this. So there's, you know, I, we, I don't think we've, we've never had any kind of pity or feeling mm -hmm. bad or why did this happen to us? Uh, it's just, you know, okay, this is the cards we've been dealt and we've got to play them. And that's what we've tried to do. And you're right, Dr. Deming. I mean, we've always been pretty active, uh, biking and uh, sports has been a part of, part of what we've done. And, uh, you know, and so we, we've tried to carry that on. We have had a goal as a couple to ride our bikes in every state. And uh, we we're going to accomplish that last July and we were ready to go. And then the states we had uh, to go uh, pedal in uh, wouldn't allow anybody from Iowa to come because of the high <laughs> incidents of COVID here. So we, um, you know, we put that aside. We're going to try to get that accomplished this year. So we, instead of riding in other states, we decided to ride in every county in Iowa. And uh, we did. And we got it done. <laughs> and that was, uh, it was eye opening. We both grew up in small towns. Maria, she mentioned in Granger and I in Central City over in the eastern part of the state. And uh, so it was fun to, to ride in those counties and small towns and uh, find parts of Iowa that uh, we had never been to before. And it's, I would encourage others to do that. You don't necessarily have to ride bikes in it, but I think just to go visit some of the uh, off the path spots and it, it was fun. And it was really, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to um, 
to uh, talk about something that you brought up and, and, uh, and that's uh, helping others. And one way of doing it is to take the wisdom that you gain from your cancer journey and use it not just to illuminate your own path, but to help others. So uh, this last Sunday, uh, Maria's uh, letter to the editor was featured as, an, uh, as a guest op-ed about radon. And um, Maria, why don't you give a little bit of background about um, you're a non-smoker with lung cancer, right. uh, which prompts us, most people go, well, gosh, how in the heck did I get this? Um, right. And uh, what did you learn about uh, lung cancer and non, non-smokers? And uh, how has that propelled you into the world of advocacy? Yeah, thank you. That's no, I, I was shocked. I really was shocked. And and the, the reading that I did, I mean, I had I had heard of radon, but I didn't realize how prevalent it was in Iowa. So I did some research on that. And if you go to the EPA website, uh, it'll show you all the counties in the whole United States. And there's this big swath of red, which is the danger zone, that all of Iowa is a red zone. So it's it's like um there, it was just incredulous to me. And there's no uh, need, according to current law, to test your home for radon when you buy and sell a home. We had never tested our homes for radon. We lived in four different houses in Iowa as we moved from the Cedar Rapids area back to here. And so, of course, once I found that out, uh, we went to our local hardware store. And for about a $12 kit, you can test your own home. And it was double the limit where it should be. So, um, but no, they say 70% of households in Iowa have a level that's higher than what it should be. So then uh, since ours was high, um, it was fairly easy really to find a certified installer to put the mitigation system in. So we had that done. They give you a test to recheck it in a week. It was back down to under the the current level of four. So, but no, I mean, the statistics are, are pretty scary. And the other thing about um, not necessarily radon, but the prevalence of lung cancer. I mean, it's the, in smokers and non-smokers. I mean, it's the number one cancer killer and it kills more people than breast cancer, colon cancer and prostate cancer combined lung cancer. And I know you know that. Um, and it, it was just, you know, a non-smoking woman has a better chance of dying of lung cancer than she does breast cancer. So I was talking to some of the doctoral nursing students at Mount Mercy the other day on a Zoom call. And I said, um, let's just start off by a quick question. What's the color for breast cancer? Pink. Uh, What's the color of ribbon for lung cancer? Silence. Nobody knows. And, And the federal funding, I wish I had the statistics in front of me, Federal funding for lung cancer research is like nothing. And maybe you know the statistic, nothing compared to colon cancer, breast cancer. And I, I'm not saying I don't think they need funding. They do. But lung cancer funding is, is, is not good. You know, and I think there, I think what we found is a perception. If you tell people you have lung oh. cancer, they almost think, well, yeah, you deserve, you it. deserve you, it. You smoked and... Uh, you know, any other kind, you tell somebody they have, you know, colon cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, whatever it is, you immediately get empathy or sympathy, lung cancer, people look at you, and we'd always, we kind of develop this, I'm a non-smoker, we think it was radon, right. so you almost have to do this qualifier, right. saying, we had lung cancer, but this is the reason, it wasn't because mm-hmm. she smoked, or it was around right. secondary smoke, and that, that's really unfortunate that that's yeah. kind of the perception that's out there is that lung cancer, well, you did it to yourself. And most cases yeah. you didn't, or many cases you didn't. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many ways we could go here. I mean, <laughs> uh, cigarette smoking is not illegal. It's not immoral. Um, both of my parents died at age 52 of cigarette smoking. My mom died of lung cancer. My dad died of sudden cardiac death. They were very good people. And, and, and um, it, it's just the knowledge of 
the risk and then the addiction that happens and yes. then all of the marketing we could do a whole a whole series yes. on the evils of the marketing of tobacco and now all of these products that are being sold, sold to children to get them addicted so we still have a, a tobacco use problem in Iowa Tobacco use has come down from about 50% uh, when I was growing up down to about 18%, but it is still the number one reversible cause of death is tobacco. And um, um, so thank you for bringing that up. We still have work to do and we know how we can help reduce uh, tobacco use. And um, part of that is uh, laws against uh, selling to children and marketing to children, and also increasing the state sales tax on a pack of cigarettes is the most effective way to yep. get fewer people to smoke. Let's let's go back to the radon. Thank you for bringing that up because um, a lot of people do not know that uh, number one, that radon causes cancer. Number two, that we are in a hotbed of radon right here in Iowa. And number three, it is very inexpensive to test your home for radon. Right. Um, maybe I'd ask you, do you have your letter there with you? And would you wanna maybe read oh. a paragraph of your letter? So Maria, um, as she has taken, you know, this bump in her road of life and used it as an incentive to learn more, has now also decided to make it her mission to make sure other people know more about it so that they can per mitigate their homes and perhaps avoid cancer. So um, she wrote this beautiful op-ed piece that, as I mentioned, was just published in the uh, Sunday Des Moines Register. And do you want to share part of that? Sure. I, I actually really liked their artist um, because when you see what that looks like, I think that's pretty attention grabbing actually. And, I, and I'm going to share that on our, uh, we have a, a wellness blog as well. So I actually just contacted the editor to see if I could use that picture uh, on our blog. And uh, he said he doesn't usually just give a blanket okay, but in this case, that would be fine. Um, so probably, um, and some of this we've alluded to, but I just started off by saying, did you know that Iowa leads the nation in deadly radon concentrations in our homes? Even after 40 years in healthcare, both as a nurse and then a nurse practitioner, I was unaware of this frightening fact um, yes, I'd heard of radon, but had absolutely no idea that our state had a radon concentration of six times the national average EPA recommended action limit. And I ended the article by basically saying, sorry about the wrestling here. Um, and I do want to mention this too, because I know you know Gail. So Gail Orcutt was uh, an educator um, who had a diagnosis of uh, lung cancer, also a never smoker. And her quote was really good. She said, fixing radon is easy, lung cancer is not. So, you know, and I, again, if you want to talk more about Gail, because she was, she was a tireless advocate for testing for radon in homes. Um, I think she went to Washington DC and testified to Senate subcommittees, is that, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. She was a lifelong educator and, uh, like you, a non-smoker, never smoker, and was diagnosed with lung cancer and um, took on the passion of, of her uh, commitment to fight cancer and her talent as a teacher. And uh, we would spend every January up at the state house meeting with our legislators. And we also went to Washington DC a couple of times and she educated a lot of people about it. And it takes, several years of educating before the piece of legislation finally gets passed. So uh, we will definitely enlist the, the, the two of you in our ongoing campaign to yeah. help uh, create a healthier world. Thank you. We're, we're happy to help and do that. So, yeah. Um, maybe shift gears just a little bit. Let's get back to philosophically speaking. So one of the things that um, you mentioned reminded me of um, two sayings, and they're Latin sayings, which always make them cooler, and they're sort of 
part of this whole uh, re-emergence of stoicism, you know, be a stoic. And there are two phrases, and I'll say them in Latin and then in English, and then have you comment on how you might interpret these now after the diagnosis of an treatable but incurable cancer. So the two phrases are memento mori, remember you will die someday, and amor fate, love your fate, accept what comes your way and continue. And some of the things you, you commented on about how you lived your life before you had cancer and what you're doing now to live your life, um, maybe just to ask you to respond to those phrases and what they mean to you or what do you think they mean or how they might um, describe uh, how you're living your life currently. Yeah, I mean, I know, uh, you know, being in healthcare, especially working in the emergency room, I mean, people died in front of me all the time. I mean, I would take the bodies to the morgue. I mean, I, I saw life. I saw we would have babies born in the ER. You know, I mean, I, I saw the gamut as an emergency room nurse of almost 18 years before I decided to go back to graduate school. So, um, so from a healthcare perspective, and you have to keep it together. That's the other thing. You, you got to keep it together. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I've learned that you do need to be mindful of your emotions and you don't always have to keep it together. You know, Pat has been an amazing sounding board. And, uh, but you know, how I grew up, the stoicism, you mentioned the stoicism, you know, uh, a week after our son Bart was killed, as Pat said, the kids had gone back to school. I was in graduate school at the time and I was supposed to commute to Iowa City for school. And I didn't think I really wanted to go that day. Um, and Pat had gone back to work and, and my grandmother called and she had to have been in her nineties. And she said, well, how are you doing Maria? And I said, well, not so great grandma. Everybody's, you just want the world to stop. You know, don't you see we're grieving, you know, why? And she said, you know, Maria, tragedy happens in all families. And I was like, okay, I know, but you know, uh, it's, this is our family. This is now. So, you know, is there a stoicism there? Sure. Um, but you keep living your life and you know, you're going to die. You know, um, when my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer and he was a, he, both my parents really are, are big doers. And, uh, it was a couple of weeks later, he goes, well, I've got my music picked, picked out for the funeral. And do you want to hear the songs? I go, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to think about this. You know? I'll, I'll wait till the curtain <laughs> goes. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, he knew he was going to die. He knew he, he, was, he wanted to have a say. I mean, and so it's like, I know I'm going to die and part of me it's like this mindful denial because i don't want to think about it all i i i know i know what my diagnosis is um i know i've had my year i i want to have more you know um but if if i live my life thinking this could be my last week for me personally i'd go crazy yeah so Wait, let me, like, let me let me put a different spin on it. So okay. uh, for me, remembering you will die someday is, is, is like this clarion call, a oh, trumpet blast to wake up and live today. And so for me, I think of, you know, okay, you have two choices. You can go to your bedroom, get in bed and pull the covers over your head and just die because we're all going to die anyway. Or... The fact that I'm going to die someday is what makes today so valuable. And it's kind of this call to don't yeah. waste a minute of today because I, yeah. I'm, I'm not dead yet. You know, there is joy to be found right. today. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. And I think um, that is a good way to be. And, um, you know, some of it has been going around our house saying, we got to get rid of some of this stuff. We got to get, you know, <laughs> you know, I tend to be the hoarder. Pat is not, but it's just like, I know I'm going to die, but I don't want, I, I need to get through some of this stuff, but more importantly, we want to go and get our goals accomplished. I cannot wait 
to, uh, you know, till we go on our bike ride out east to, to cross off some more states. And it was fun doing the 99, you know, counties, getting those crossed and planning that. So yes, living, looking forward to things like that. Um, you know, we watch our little granddaughter every three days a week. She, she brings us joy. You know, I mean, there are so many things I feel very fortunate with to have, you know, kids that are both close by and their spouses are amazing people. You know, I mean, how, how much better does that get, mm -hmm. you know, and my mom's in good health. Um, she just came back from Arizona. So, I mean, I really am blessed. So, you know, uh, I, I don't have a Latin phrase for this, Dr. Deming, but one of the uh, quotes I've always tried to live by is, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not why ships are built. And uh, that doesn't mean you go out and take foolish risks, but it also means you don't, you know, pull the covers over you and just, you know, wait for the inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, you know, and Maria mentioned our granddaughter. I mean, it's just as we're beginning this uh, journey, uh, you know, Penelope, our, our only grandchild, was born in February. And so, you know, that's... Um, you know, kind of the, the cycle of life, you know, Maria's got this diagnosis, but now we have this newborn in the world. And, uh, um, and it, that's really been joyful for us because yeah. she, uh, I, any little baby, of course, brings joy. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so, you know, I think that's just kind of thing helped us, uh, you know, uh, mitigate, you know, sort of the, the worst parts of this. And, uh, and uh, that's, it's been a real, uh, real blessing. The timing couldn't have been any better for her to, to arrive in the world. Um, yeah, I think something too that gets us, gets me through things, um, you know, that gets me through tragedy, whether it was our son's accident, and and again working in healthcare, especially especially the ER, and seeing what terrible things can happen to people. Um, part of me was always like, you know, there's a lot of people that have it worse, you know, it, there's a lot worse. There's a lot worse I could be going through. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of keeps me through. And, and again, you mentioned going to bed and pull the cover over your face. I mean, if that worked, <laughs> I'd do it, but it doesn't work, <laughs> you know? And I think I would even tell that to my patients, you know, working, in the office, you know, um, they always talked about how they were stressed and, and I was like, well, you know, maybe you could focus, you know, working in a GI clinic, we had a lot of patients with abdominal pain. It was vague. Nobody could find what's wrong, you know, and I think a lot of it was due to stress, not all of it, but some of it. And, you know, I would talk to patients about that and I would say, you know, worrying is only making your situation probably worse you know, maybe you should go see a counselor and talk the, these things through. Well, that didn't always go over so well, but <laughs> they wanted the magic pill to take care of everything. But, but, you know, there are always people that are worse off. And so you make, you make the best of what you have that day, you know? So that's, I don't know if that's a philosophy of mine, but it's something yeah. I think about. And when you come in, uh, obviously you come into the uh, cancer office, you don't have to look too far to the left or to the right, right. to see someone less fortunate. And um, so the, the second Latin frame was, was amor fate, which is uh, basically, you know, you just take what comes your way because realistically there's things in life you can change. Most things we can't change and uh, you have to face them. So to face them, openly and honestly and take them in stride uh, tends to generate more peace of mind and happiness than trying to constantly swim up river, um, changing the world that you can't change. Right. And, and you know what? Humor does a lot. I mean, you can always look for joy and humor in things to a point, of course, but I mean, sometimes you can't take yourself too seriously. Um, and again, look for the joy, look for some purpose, be, be more mindful, you know. And so you guys are, are very joyful and I've had the opportunity to spend some time with you. We camped out together as, with an <laughs> above and beyond cancer trip up to uh, Yellow River State Forest. 
And I also uh, remember having a really nice conversation with you both as you were push pushing the baby stroller and we did a three mile walk together at Waterworks Park. <laughs> and um, um, I won't go into the whole story, but I was amazed to learn that you guys actually have been hobos and have... <laughs> I think it's beyond the statute of limitations, but but yes. stowed a ride on a freight train with a six pack of beer. And um, anyway, you just you have been so inspirational. <laughs> but that that idea of finding joy, I truly believe that part of our mission on Earth is to find joy and spread joy, even in midst of the sorrow that we all face. Um, a good friend of mine and patient shared with me a poem, and it's, I'm not going to read the whole poem, but it's, it's by Jack Gilbert, and it talks uh, really a bit, um, about sorrow all around, and so it could be like, like today and COVID and mass shootings and, and um, um, discrimination against people with different color skins, that there's, that is is around all the time. But the, the poem makes a plea that even though we get and appropriately upset about uh, injustice, that there's still time, even in the midst of sorrow and injustice, to find joy and spread joy. And in saying so, Jack Gilbert writes, we must risk delight. We can do without pleasure but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. And so those of us, I mean, there's time for righteous indignation about all of the sorrows and injustices, but that's not what the whole world is about. And even in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of injustice, it's not only okay, it's part of our calling to find joy and spread joy. Yeah. Who, who was it that said, in the midst of tragedy, look for the helpers? Yeah. Oh, who said, somebody said, I can't remember that who said that. But look for the helpers. If So you're not overwhelmed with all the, the terrible tragedy. Um, because, and sometimes I can't even bring myself to read, I'll read the headlines, but not read everything because there is so much, but, but again, if you look for the helpers or be a helper, you know, that's how you get through life. I think, mm -hmm. you know, so. so any, uh, last words of wisdom as we bring it to a close, um, maybe, or, or what's on your bucket list and which states are you going to <laughs> ride and uh, besides riding in all 50 states do you have other things that are um that you, you sort of have uh penciled in as things to do well we have uh one uh we in 2015 we rode our bikes across the country uh by ourselves we left jacksonville beach florida in october and ended up in san diego in december and uh so we're really proud to do that. And we'd like to do now a, uh, on, on that trip across the United States, we met two women who had done a uh, coast to coast and they said, uh, then they had done a border to border. So our next one, we'd like to start up in um, North Dakota, Canadian border and ride down to you know Texas, uh, Mexico border. We hope to be able to do that in 2022. Uh, next year. And then I have an individual goal, which Maria doesn't necessarily share, is to see a baseball but game. But I will. <laughs> to see a baseball game in every state. And uh, so I've got to get going on that one. I've seen, I got several states to like get done. The states we still have left to do are... Everything east. There's 11 states plus D Washington, D.C. It's everything east of Pennsylvania. So all the New England states, a couple of the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, my sister... Uh, Jane lives out in Delaware. So she said from her place within two hours, there's six states and we need to do all of them. So we'll, oh, we'll, we'll visit her, but yeah, all the new Maryland, Delaware, uh, New Jersey, New York, all the new England states. So, but the other thing that we actually need to sign up for, we've never done the full rag bride. 
So we've just done a couple of days if it comes through the middle of the state, but we've never done the whole rag bray. So we want to sign up for that. Um, I did on my 60th birthday, we, with family, we left Council Bluffs and got to Muscatine in five days. So that was, we did our own kind of personal rag bray, but um, we want to do the official rag bray this year. So rag oh, bray, excellent. get the rest of the states next year, get across the country, the north, south. So And baseball. And baseball. And baseball. Did I forget okay. baseball? <laughs> <laughs> Many a time you'd love to forget baseball, but yeah so well that's kind of it i want to thank you for sharing your story uh for sharing um your essence and also thank you for what you're doing to make a difference in the world I and mean, you've always both of you i know your professions have been just giving professions but to in this time to take your story and to use it to make a difference a positive difference in the lives of others you inspire me and I so thank you for uh, being on tonight. And I can't wait to uh, ride bikes with you in, in a couple of weeks, right? Right, right. Yep. right. Well, I wanna thank Above and Beyond Cancer because you know, there's so many different things that the organiza organization does that I've been participating in, you know, the hiking, um, the yoga. I mean, there are so many things. And uh, I did a cooking class online. Um, I mean, there are so many things, um, and then, and then there's some that I haven't been able to participate in with COVID, but I mean, I don't, I know I didn't realize what above and beyond cancer does. And, you know, people who donate, um, it's, it's incredibly, um, it's just wonderful, you know, that they do that. So I, I do want to put a shout out for that. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. you bet. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. And thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Turn it over to you to bring us to a close. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, it was Mr. Rogers who was who was credited with "Look for the Helpers." Thank you. And, Thank um, you. There was a question on the question and answer uh, from someone, one of our viewers. Uh, they believe that there was a radon testing grant that came out through the Iowa Cancer Consortium, and they wondered if any one of us knew if there was another one of those coming down the pipe and how we could be uh, promoters uh, in our communities. Yeah, I can answer that. So the okay. Iowa Cancer Consortium has an annual uh, grant uh, uh, cycle. And um, this uh, last cycle, the grants were all used for accessibility issues related to COVID. So uh, there was a little bit of a pause on all of the different work that's being done. So uh, the, I don't know that there is a particular grant, but the, the uh, process is in place for communities and or organizations to apply to the Iowa Cancer Consortium for uh, grant opportunities. And I think there's something, somebody shared this with me that Unity Point has a pediatric safety store. And so I think you can go online and they sell like simple things like plugging your the little plugs for the outlets for children's safety. But they said they had radon kits as well. And I think it might even be free. So I, I don't know the exact link for that, but there was that. And um, I do wanna also give a shout out to the American Lung Association Pat and I are going to be doing the fight for air climb. Um, and people have generously donated already over $2,000 to our team. So I'm very excited about that. So we'll be climbing some stairs in a baseball field. Yeah, a baseball stadium. Stadium, not field. Principal Park <laughs> in May. Yeah, so good. Yeah. So. And, and one final thing on Radon. Um, uh, part of the memorials when Gail passed away, uh, she and her husband created a fund at the Community Foundation yes. for helping uh, individuals who aren't able to, to mitigate for a uh, radon. So the yes. Iowa Cancer Consortium still has some programs that are ongoing. There's opportunities for grants for other communities. And there's also um, the ORCUT Fund at the Community Foundation. And as you mentioned, the Iowa American Lung Association is also doing a lot in in promotion as well so yes, yes. thank you we did Back record, to you, Chris. Uh, we did record this session and it will be on uh, the above and beyond cancer youtube page or channel 
Um, and it will also be on the Mercy One website uh, where you can watch that. Just search the Mercy One website for uh, the cancer education series and they will all pop up there. So uh, if, if you're trying to remember some of the facts and things that were shared uh, today, when you speak, were speaking with friends, you can say, hey, I'll just send you the YouTube link uh, to it and, uh, and we will get that out to everybody as soon as we're able to put this on our YouTube page tomorrow. That's great. Thank you all very thank much. You. For Thanks, Ryan, Pat. Thank, thank you. Me. You were wonderful.